And good evening. Tonight we start with that catastrophic scene in St. Louis, the deadly flash flooding after a record shattering downpour. More than nine inches of rain falling in a single day, the highest total in a century. Street after street, you see it here completely flooded, cars covered up to their roofs. At least one person found dead inside of their vehicle. First responders able to rescue more than 70 people. The crews going from one apartment to the next by boat. Others help as they walk through waist deep water. A crew from our St. Louis affiliate, KSDK, trapped in the rushing waters, filming part of their rescue as well. That entire team tonight making it home safely. The rain still coming down with growing fears that another system could further devastate the area tomorrow. NBC's Maggie Vespa is on the ground in the storm zone tonight for us. Freaking crazy. That's the highway. Tonight, stunning images of the latest American city to get slammed with severe weather. Across St. Louis, historic rainfall and flash flooding. We got stalled out cars here. Forcing rescue after rescue. We have seven people trapped on a roof. Roughly 100 people trapped in these apartments, evacuated by boat. I was terrified because it's just so high. More than nine inches of rain falling since midnight, shattering records set in 1915 and turning highways and roads into raging rivers. It was so dangerous with the water flow, we had to pull them out. We couldn't even get our trucks out. Authorities confirming one person trapped in their car has died. And in suburban St. Peter's, water surged into an animal shelter. Staff scrambled, saving most of the animals, but devastated to learn 10 puppies drowned. Thank you so much. Reporters from our affiliate KSDK out covering the chaos were rescued by firefighters when fast moving water flooded their news car. How insane was it to become a part of the story that you're out there trying to cover? It's just a testament to the things that we warn people about. They're real. It can happen to anybody. The mayhem in Missouri marking the latest severe weather event to wallop the U.S. Tonight in the Pacific Northwest and South, 32 million Americans remain under heat alerts. Dallas hitting its 31st 100 degree day of the year. The extreme heat, scientists say, supporting more intense rainfall, making flash floods like this one in St. Louis more frequent. All right, Maggie Vespa joins us now from Hazelwood, Missouri. And Maggie, we saw that this was historical. Did officials have any warning that it was going to get this bad this quick? Yeah, Tom, they had kind of the same warning that everybody else did, which is basically the weather forecast. But keep in mind, as you know, meteorology is kind of an imperfect science, and those forecasts were differing. So what St. Louis got overnight was really on the extreme end of what meteorologists were saying was possible. And again, they note St. Louis, this recent stat came out really stunned us. Overnight last night got more rain than it typically gets in July and August combined, Tom. No, that's incredible. So we see the water there just behind you beginning to recede, but more flooding is still possible? Right. It is. We have another round of showers and storms slated for the area overnight. Uh, again, basically overnight into the early morning hours tomorrow. It's unclear if that's likely to cause more flooding in the St. Louis area. But again, that kind of imperfect science applies once again. And of course, everybody here really rattled and just praying we don't have a complete round two. Tom. Maggie Vespa leading us off tonight. Maggie, we thank you for that. In addition to flooding, the country also experiencing that record heat and wildfires. There are signs of progress in the battle against the massive California wildfire we told you about last night that is threatening thousands of homes and knocking on the doors of one of America's great national treasures, Yosemite National Park. Miguel Almaguer joins us now from Mariposa, California, where the Oak Fire continues to burn. So, Miguel, where do things stand tonight? Well, Tom, despite the damage that you see here, and it is extensive across this community, firefighters are really making tremendous progress, though this blaze has ballooned to about 20,000 acres, which makes it the largest wildfire this summer in California. Crews say it's actually burning towards a fire zone that's already burned and been torched before, so this blaze should run out of active fuel to burn. That means it could be fully contained as early as this weekend. That would happen really at breakneck speed, considering this fire broke out just last Friday. So certainly some good news on the fire front. We know 41 structures have been destroyed in this fire. Many of them are homes just like this one. So many people will not be able to return back home for quite some time. Yeah, Miguel, um, and on that point, I know you've spoken to some people who've been forced out, people forced to evacuate. Some of them, like we see right in front of you, have lost their homes in this place. Give us a sense of how people are reacting and are any hoping to come back sooner than they should. 
Well, Tom, they're utterly devastated here. Many of the people who live in this area, including the man that lived here, had to run for his life to make it off of this hill into a safe area. They all want to come back and see their property. The roads here are still closed. There are still down power lines in the street. So getting back here won't be easy. It's something that the fire department and the local power company is working to let access to residents here. But when they return, this is what they're going to find, Tom. Everything destroyed. All right, Miguel Almaguer and his team from the fire zone again tonight. Miguel, we thank you. Now to an NBC News exclusive. Our Lester Holt sitting down with Attorney General Merrick Garland to ask him about the mounting pressure to indict former President Trump in light of the January 6th committee's investigation. The AG not ruling out high-level prosecutions, even if it deeply divides the country. You said in no uncertain terms the other day that no one is above the law. Yeah. That said... Um, the indictment of a former president, of a perhaps candidate for president, would arguably tear the country apart. Is that your concern as you make your decision down the road here? Do you have to think about things like that? Look, we pursue justice without fear or favor. We intend to hold everyone, anyone who was criminally responsible for the events surrounding January 6th, or any attempt to interfere with the lawful transfer of power from one administration to another accountable. That's what we do. We don't pay any attention to other uh, issues with respect to that. So if Donald Trump were to become a candidate for president again, that would not change your schedule or, or how you move forward or don't move forward? Uh, I'll say again that uh, we will hold accountable anyone who is criminally responsible for attempting to interfere with the transfer, legitimate lawful transfer of power from one administration to the next. All right, for a closer look at the possible legal battle ahead in Washington for former President Trump, I want to bring in NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos. Danny, is the attorney general saying he's basically going to go after President Trump? How do you interpret what he said there? He's saying nothing, candidly. I mean, really, he's saying we'll pursue justice without fear or favor and nobody's above the law. I and mean, you can find that in the U.S. Attorney's Manual pretty much. So he's not committing to anything, but no surprise. He's the attorney general. He can't really signal what he's going to do. That's not what the DOJ does. That might be what the January 6th committee does. But DOJ conducts its investigations in absolute secret. If you're a target, you don't usually find out about that until you're indicted. So no surprise that he's not saying much. The, the question and the statement, of course, coming after we know members of Vice President Mike Pence's inner circle have testified to the grand jury. Should President Trump, former President Trump, be worried? Uh, he will not be worried, but that's just because he's Trump. Uh, should he be worried? Look, I take the view as a criminal defense attorney that any time a grand jury is uttering your name, whether you're a witness, target, or subject, you should always be concerned. Uh, but in a case like this, just because a grand jury is convened doesn't necessarily mean there are going to be indictments of President Trump. More likely, if there are indictments, there are of people below him in the chain of command or in his orbit because the president, the former president, successfully created a number of different buffers, to use a term from Godfather, that did the, did the things that are most likely to get them in trouble. Uh, the president himself, though, I mean, Merrick Garland has to consider whether or not uh, it is good for the institution, for DOJ, for the executive branch, and for the other branches of government, for um, the executive branch to charge the former head of the executive branch. It's those considerations uh, that make a prosecution unlikely. That plus all the other defenses that we're just not seeing through the January 6th committee's presentation. Merrick Garland, however, is considering those, whether they be the First Amendment or even presidential immunity. So your gut is telling you, just to be very clear, and telling us you don't think the president's going to be prosecuted. That's right. I mean, for a couple different reasons. And I guess uh, this doesn't take much in that it's been a year and a half, more, and there is no prosecution. And I have to operate on the assumption that whatever the January 6th committee has... Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. I mean, people are thinking... Oh, they must be seeing this for the first time. But but the FBI and everyone else investigating this must know about that, you would think. Let's just talk about the power that the January 6th committee doesn't have. They can't go to a witness and say, hey, if you cooperate, we'll reduce your prison sentence. The January 6th committee yeah. can't even put anybody in prison. As a, a, someone who defends white collar and other federal criminal cases... You cannot imagine the power of the federal government going to one of your cohorts and saying, well, you have a choice. You're at the crossroads of life here. You can either help us and give us all kinds of bad information about a guy that we really want, 
Uh, and if you do, then you can spend less or even no time in prison. That is an exceptional power that only DOJ has. The January 6th committee does not have it. Plus, they have grand juries. They have secrecy. They have so many powers that the uh, January 6th committee does not have. I've been operating under the assumption that whatever the J6 committee has, the DOJ has orders of magnitude more than they do. And if they have all that and they have not yet indicted, that tells me I just don't see them unearthing a whole lot more right. starting now. Okay, Danny Savalas, thanks for that. We appreciate it. Lester's interview, of course, coming as former President Trump returns to Washington for the first time since he left office. The former president delivering the keynote speech at the America First Policy Institute's summit, with his potential rival and former Vice President Mike Pence delivering his own speech only a few blocks away. Peter Alexander has more. Tonight, the return, 552 days since leaving the White House after the deadly assault on the Capitol in his name. Former President Trump's back in Washington with a dark view of the country. Our country is now a cesspool of crime. We have blood, death, and suffering on a scale once unthinkable. And again, falsely claiming he won the 2020 election. We got millions and millions more votes. What a disgrace it was, but... We may just have to do it again. Still, even in the Republican Party, Mr. Trump's been damaged by the unrelenting revelations from the January 6th committee. President Trump summoned the mob, assembled the mob, and lit the flame of this attack. Today's visit also shining a light on divisions within the GOP, with his running mate turned potential 2024 primary rival, former Vice President Mike Pence, in Washington as well, offering a stark contrast. Some people may choose to focus on the past. But elections are about the future. And I believe conservatives must focus on the future to win back America. Their dueling appearances coming just as Pence's publisher announced the title of his upcoming book, So Help Me God, where Mr. Trump's once loyal sidekick chronicles President Trump's severing of their relationship on January 6th. All right, Peter joins us now from the White House again tonight. Peter, as we report out how Republican voters may or may not want former President Trump to be their candidate in 2024, there are some Republican leaders who are making it very clear they are still standing with the former president. I think that's right, Tom. Tonight, actually, among those who welcomed Mr. Trump back to Washington was Kevin McCarthy, obviously the man who wants to be the next House Speaker. Immediately after January 6th, you'll remember that he said, I've had it with this guy. Also, Lindsey Graham, who on the night of the attack on the Capitol said, count me out. But today, Tom, he insisted he hopes the former president runs again. Clearly a change of heart there. Peter, you and I covered the president's first campaign, and you've been covering him now for several years. I'm curious, yeah. any change in tone or message, or is he sticking with the types of arguments that got him elected in 2016? Well, notably, uh, the former president was speaking from a teleprompter in his remarks today, perhaps an effort to try to be more focused on the message he's hoping to deliver here. To be honest, it sounded a lot like his American Carnage inaugural address uh, from back in 2017. He talked a lot about crime and blood-soaked streets. He was uh, heavily critical of the transgender community, particularly attacking transgender athletes with some mockery of that community and about some of his critics, including the January 6th committee itself, Tom, he referred to them as political hacks and thugs. All right, Peter Alexander for us tonight from the White House with the former president's return to Washington. Headlines now questioning possible prosecution and the rise of Florida Governor Ron DeSantis with Republican voters. What could that do to Trump's future political career? I want to bring in Tara Palmieri. She's a senior political correspondent for Puck News and writes The Washington Mall, which always gets Washington mm -hmm. buzzing. Tara, let's start with Trump's message today. We heard a lot of the past, right? Mm -hmm. Crime, he was hammering inflation. But as Peter just reported, he went after the transgender community as well. Are, are these the kind of things he wants to put together if he does take on Florida Governor Ron DeSantis if, if DeSantis decides to run? I think Trump definitely sees that Ron DeSantis has been able to really um, own the culture war issues in a way that even he hasn't because Trump has been so obsessed with election, election integrity in terms of his own election. Whereas all that time he spends griping about what happened in 2020, Ron DeSantis is as a governor with a bully pulpit is able to actually pick these fights, these culture wars, like going after Disney and, uh, you know, critical race theory, gender issues in schools. So, you know, he doesn't have that power, Trump, and he sees it as a weakness. So I can see why he's trying to embrace that. But it's a lot of talk and not the same sort of action that you're seeing from Ron DeSantis. 
both either way it fires at the base it's something he's talked about in the past but it seems like he's really trying to inflame his supporters with these issues you know we had an interesting split screen today right you had the former president and the former vice president and mm -hmm. clearly not on the same page not even on speaking terms <laughs> right. anymore to be clear is there room for for mike pence in the Republican Party to run for president. I ask this because we had our old friend Matt Dowd here talking about the right. poll numbers Trump would need. He never broke 30 in the primaries in 2016 because so many people ran. Does Pence still have a chance? Does he have a voice for the Republican voter out there? It's a really good question. I'm not sure because Pence essentially was made by Trump, right? And he has almost the exact same agenda issues. The only thing is the tone is a little different than Trump's, but they're basically running on the same ideas, crime, uh, but you know, uh, immigration, inflation, yeah. uh, critical race theory, culture war issues. The difference is that, like, Trump's base really does not like Pence, right, because Trump has fed them so much red meat about what right. a terrible vice president he was. Maybe Pence can win over some swing voters, but Pence's actual positions um, are pretty extreme for even, you know, swing voters. He's against abortion in all cases. Mm -hmm. He's a uh, devout evangelical. And I just think um, he doesn't really speak to swing voters the same way a, you know, Glenn Youngkin or right. even a DeSantis does. Um, I also just think I, I read a poll recently, a New York Times Siena poll that showed Pence polling at only 6% among primary right. voters and Trump at more than 50% with DeSantis at 25%. There's no way you survive in the primaries with those numbers. Through. I want to talk about your new reporting for Puck, okay. which is really interesting. It seems like we're hearing about this more and more. You sort of have this contingent from the Obama White House that worked with President Biden when he was vice president. Mm -hmm speaking out against Biden right now, not on the same page with Biden whatsoever. And I, I almost wonder if they're setting the table to create another candidate, to build up another candidate, to take on either Biden, if Biden decides to run again, or take on whatever Republican nominee. Uh, it's a really interesting observation. I think that they see that Biden is a weak candidate in 2024. I mean, you see the polling. People are saying they don't want him to run again. His, his numbers are in the 30s. I think that Axelrod, David Axelrod, who worked with um, Obama, he created one of his Obama. closest, if not closest advisors. Exactly. Right. And he worked hand in hand with uh, President Biden as well and his team that was in the vice president's office and now in the White House. And I think it's really it's hard for them to hear him saying things like the age is a real liability and an issue. And he's not sure if Biden can run that he's showing that he's faltering. They're not afraid. They're, they're, they're coming out publicly and saying this. It's not a whisper campaign anymore. It's not a whisper campaign. And in fact, that's why David Axelrod told The New York Times that the age was an issue. And it's something that the White House is super sensitive about. And it's something they're going to have to confront. And it's going to be really hard to confront that after a midterms, which it looks like the, the Republicans are going to pick up tons of seats in the House and could possibly win the Senate. So, you know, it's hard when you're facing Republican opposition, but when you have opposition within your own party, it makes it even yeah. more difficult for the Biden administration. And I think that they would they wish that their uh, old friends from Obama world would maybe right. be a bit more supportive. Be on the same page. Exactly. Tara Palmieri from Puck News, we thank you so much. Thank Some great you. reporting. All right, next tonight, we want to turn to the warning signs for the economy. Consumer confidence dropping again this month with the Federal Reserve on the eve of another expected rate hike to tame soaring inflation. NBC's Tom Costello has more. It's the third month in a row that the consumer confidence reading shows Americans are feeling the inflation squeeze. That is the weakest level since February of last year. Americans worried about a potential recession as they pay more for gas, food, clothing, housing, cars, just about everything. In Sacramento, Josanne English's life has come apart. After earning $100,000 a year, she lost her job, then watched her bank account eaten up by inflation. Evicted from their home, her three kids stayed with family while she and her partner lived in her car. This has been the worst, most challenging part of my life. Every day, I wonder what, what's going to happen next. Am I going to be able to make it? I'm living paycheck to paycheck. <laughs> The inflation effect on display in corporate results today. Walmart says Americans are buying more food, but fewer big ticket items. Despite high demand, supply chain kinks are forcing GM to ship fewer vehicles. Shopify cutting 10% of its workforce. Now the Federal Reserve is poised to raise interest rates yet again tomorrow. What's the risk that by raising rates again, the Fed could push the economy into recession? There's definitely a risk that these rate hikes could result in a recession. Uh, the Fed is raising rates more quickly than it has in a very long time.
All right, Tom joins us now from Washington. Tom, there's a bigger fear here, right? They sometimes say when it comes to the economy, if the U.S. catches a cold, other countries get pneumonia because of the reliance on a robust commerce. Uh, this is absolutely still the biggest economy in the world, and you're 100 percent right. We already know the IMF is warning that the world may be teetering on the edge of recession right now. And this is not a unique problem. Inflation is ravaging many economies. I mean, in Canada, it's at about 9 percent. In the U.K., 8 percent. Across the Eurozone, 8 to 9 percent, depending on the country. So central banks around the world are also raising rates, trying to get their inflation picture under control. But what happens in this economy, the biggest in the world, very much sets the tone for the rest of the world, Tom. All right, Tom Costell for us, Tom, we thank you. So with the news of another potential interest rate hike by the Federal Reserve and many worrying about a recession, I want to take a closer look at what this all means and what are the chances, if any, things take a turn for the better. Joining us now is former chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors under the Obama administration, Austin Goolsby, now a professor at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. Austin, thanks for joining Top Story tonight. I want to get right to it. Is the recession already here or are we just waiting for the inevitable? I hope not. Uh, I don't think it has to be inevitable. But it's worth remembering that since World War II, we've had 14 recessions in the United States, and more than two-thirds of them were caused by the Fed raising interest rates faster than the economy could handle. So in a period like this, where the Fed feels like it's on the back foot and needs to catch up by raising rates faster than they have in a long time, it, that that's definitely a risk. So I, I got to ask you, is there still time for the quote unquote soft landing? I know you've spoken a lot about this. Essentially, the Fed raising rates without the contraction in the GDP that could trigger that recession. It, it's definitely possible. And th th we're in a very strange economy. Normally, when there are recessions, there's not really an argument about whether it's a recession because everything goes down. It's a broad based slowdown of the economy. The unemployment rate rises. People start losing their jobs. What, we, what we're in is this moment where growth has slowed, but we're still adding. We added 372,000 jobs last month. That's double, triple the normal uh, steady state job creation you would think for a, for a moment like this. So that doesn't look anything like a recession. That does give the Fed a little bit of wiggle room. And if, you know, if we could put the COVID era behind us so that people could go back to spending money on services rather than on physical goods, that would probably relieve some of the supply chain distortions. Uh, explain, explain that, though. Uh, simplify that for me, that, that last point, because anecdotally, you know, you talk to people anywhere around this country and they can't stop talking about how much people are spending in certain sectors, right? You go to airports and, and there are just lines. You go to hotels, they're packed with people. People are still buying goods like crazy. Talk to me about that last point you just made where, where Americans should be spending versus where they are spending. Well, historically, every rich country of the world, we spend the vast majority of our money on services. And that was true in the United States before COVID. But then in COVID, there were a lot of people who did not were not able to or did not want to go to work in the service sectors because they thought it was dangerous, because they were shut down, et cetera. And so there was a massive shift to, of what people spent their money on toward physical goods and it totally overloaded the supply chain. Demand for cars went up, for TVs went up, demand for housing went up. All of this stuff that normally goes down went up. And that's been the lion's share of the inflation has been on all of this stuff that where we overloaded the supply chain. So if we can expand capacity and deal with this supply chain problem, it's possible we could get inflation down without having to create a recession. But it's a knife's edge. You know, maybe it's a little wider than a knife's edge, but it's it's a difficult balance. Let's finally, put it that way. finally, because we don't have a whole lot of time, and if you could answer this briefly, I know it's kind of complex, but, but try for me. When we talk about the recession, I know we've had so many across the country. Remind our viewers, what should they expect? Should they expect massive layoffs, a real estate crash, prices continuing to skyrocket? Yeah, nobody likes recessions because everything gets worse in a recession. People will start losing their jobs. Normally, that becomes the main headline problem that people have with the economy. But on top of that, incomes go down. The stock market tends to suffer if, if you have investments. 
it gets harder to afford products where the prices are already higher. So nobody wants recession uh, and we're teetering on the edge. All right, we're back now with new details on yesterday's shooting at Dallas Love Field Airport. Police releasing new video showing how the chaos unfolded inside the terminal in real time as we learn more about the suspect. NBC's Stephen Romo has more. Tonight, new videos released by Dallas authorities showing a woman firing a gun at Dallas Love Field Airport and people scattering in fear. Go blue at uh, Dallas Love Field, somebody's shooting. Police say 37-year-old Portia Odufua fired a handgun at the ceiling approximately two times, and when an officer told her to drop her weapon, she pointed it at him, according to the arrest affidavit. The officer, identified by Dallas police as Ronald Cronin, hid behind a ticket kiosk and fired his gun, striking Odufua multiple times. She was arrested and taken to a nearby hospital. Police say she's out of surgery and is in stable condition. Odufua is now charged with aggravated assault against a public servant. Police say other federal charges are possible. Police also say the handgun she used was not hers, and she'd been barred from possessing a firearm since August 2018. Yeah, we're, we're looking into who, where that weapon came from, uh, but ultimately, again, she was prohibited and, and got a firearm from somebody. Officials say Odufua was previously arrested for bank robbery and arson in 2019. Police saying those charges were dismissed, the latter for mental health reasons. Then in 2020, she was apprehended by peace officers at Love Field Airport and taken into custody for a mental health evaluation. The suspect's actions prior to arriving at the airport are still under investigation, as is the motive for the shooting. In the most recent incident, police say she took an Uber to the airport shortly before 11 a.m., then changed into different clothes in the bathroom. Witnesses recalling Odufua's bizarre behavior before the incident. So I started walking away. I don't hang around for ranting. And she just started shooting in the air. Talking about her husband was cheating or something. And she basically said she was about to blow the sucker up. And Dallas Police Chief Eddie Garcia praising Officer Cronin and other first responders for their actions. In situations like the one we had at left field yesterday, our men and women must also be warriors. That is what Officer Cronin was. He didn't hesitate in engaging, managing to give commands to potential victims, attempting to guide them to safety, even after being involved in the most traumatic scenario of our beloved profession. All right, with that, Stephen Romo joins us now live on set. So, Stephen, you know, I have to ask you, we, we mentioned there that she should never have had a firearm. You mentioned the men mental health issues. How did she end up getting a gun? Do police have any idea? They're not telling us if they do right now. They're looking into that. One of the many things they're looking into. We know that she has had several mental health issues. That's led to many run-ins with police over the past few years. In fact, just last year, she was found by a judge incompetent to stand trial because of her mental health issues. He said that uh, she wasn't able to stand trial for that. That was for making a false report. So one of the many things they're looking into, that weapon. We've also tried to reach out to her family and uh, legal counsel. We were unsuccessful on that right now. So more to come on this story. Okay, Stephen, we appreciate that. All right, we are back now with Top Stories News Feed, and we begin with the smash and grab robbery at an antique watchmaker shop in LA. New surveillance video shows the thieves using sledgehammers to break multiple display cases before stuffing thousands of dollars in merchandise into trash bags and taking off. The group also seen covering security cams with spray paint. So far, no arrests have been made. And a shocking scene during the morning commute in Oklahoma, a security cam capturing the moment a deer crashes through the front windshield of a bus, the driver stopping the bus before opening the door for the animal. The deer appeared unharmed and ran out. The incident happened just two minutes into that driver's shift. Luckily, she was not hurt and no passengers were on board. And we're getting our first look at the upcoming drama, The Whale, and star Brendan Fraser's looks unrecognizable. The mummy and George of the Jungle actor says he sat through hours of makeup and prosthetics to turn into that role of Charlie, a 600 pound English teacher and recluse. The movie will have its world premiere at this year's Venice Film Festival, which begins August 
31st. All right, next tonight, we turn to Brittany Griner back in a Russian court today as the WNBA superstar prepares to testify at her drug trial. This as another American freed from Russia earlier this year speaks exclusively to NBC News. Tonight, he's criticizing the White House's handling of Griner's case. Here's Hallie Jackson with more. Brittany Griner in a Russian courtroom today, holding up pictures of her wife and friends as the U.S. Embassy says the WNBA superstar is doing okay. That's after Griner pleaded guilty to having cannabis oil in her luggage, facing up to 10 years in prison. Her defense team today emphasizing it was used medicinally and packed accidentally. Griner set to testify tomorrow, telling an ABC News producer she has no complaints. Do you want to say something to shout out? Good luck on the bar exam. Pressure now building to free Griner and American Paul Whelan, who's being held by the Kremlin after an espionage trial the U.S. called a mockery. I know what they went through. Trevor Reed spent nearly three years in Russian prison on charges of assaulting a police officer, which he denies, released in April in a dramatic prisoner swap. The former Marine's mission now to push to get others like Griner and Whelan released. Is the White House, is the president doing enough, in your view, to get them out? I can't say 100 percent what the White House is or is not doing, but in my opinion, the White House has the ability to get them out extremely fast, and they clearly have chosen not to do that. Reed making clear he's grateful to President Biden for getting him home, but frustrated others still are not. If you could get a message to Brittany Griner, what would you tell her right now? That she has a huge uh, base of support in the United States who is fighting for her and uh, not to give up. The White House tonight tells NBC News the president receives regular updates on the status of negotiations to get Griner and Whelan home and that he's been clear about the need to see every American who is wrongfully detained released. Tom? And someone who is used to covering international headlines, our very own Janice Mackey Freyer. She's based in Beijing, and it's been about two and a half years since she filed a short report on a flu-like virus that emerged in Wuhan. Let's take a look. Good morning, guys. Most of the nearly 300 confirmed cases are at hospitals like this one here in Wuhan, ground zero for this mysterious virus. And it's also showing up in other cities, as well as Japan, Thailand, and South Korea. The World Health Organization is holding an emergency meeting to determine whether this outbreak is now an international public health emergency. Guys, back to you. So incredible to watch that now, a mysterious virus. Since then, she's lived and reported for us through multiple quarantines and lockdowns. And now she's back in the U.S. for the first time since the pandemic began. Janice, welcome to Top Story thank and welcome you. back to the U.S. So happy that you're here. And, and thank you for all the great reporting you've been doing for NBC News. What's it like to be back? It's very strange. Um, China, in many ways, has not changed a lot in terms of how it treats the pandemic. They have what they call the zero COVID policy. So there are a lot of rules, a lot of restrictions and uh, strategy that's uh, shaped around quarantines, uh, lockdowns and testing, 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 testing. So uh, to go from an environment where it's such a, a part of life into the outside world where, you know, in most countries, you know, people are, are trying to move on and, you know, abandoning masks. And it's a very strange adjustment. Has it, to felt, be has it felt like a relief or has, is it making you nervous? Both. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> on the one hand, you know, we, we got on the flight and to an extent, you know, exhaled because it's it's been two and a half years. It's been a long time since we've since we've seen family, um, like a lot of people, we've, you know, had to endure distance and suffered losses and, you know, the loss of time and the loss of loved ones. So in, in many ways, it, it felt like a very long overdue homecoming. But on the other hand, we do have a lot of anxieties about, you know, how prevalent the virus still is. The pandemic right. is not over. And when we return to China, we need to do a centralized quarantine and hope that in that period that we're in a, a government hotel or facility, that none of us test positive. Otherwise, yeah. we'll 
uh, be put into the health care system. On now. that issue and on that front, is, do people in China still live in fear? Because we, we did see some of those videos of sort of people being forced into quarantine and, and what some of those quarantine camps, if you will, look like. Are, are people there still sort of living with that fear or have they gotten accustomed to these new rules? They're, they're, what has emerged in the last few years is it's almost like the industrialization of COVID management in that China sees this as the way that it's going to uh, eradicate the virus, get rid of the virus. It wants zero COVID. And as a public health strategy, there are some experts who could argue that there may be some merit in, in the approach in terms of how uh, isolation and lockdowns and close contact tracing is is implemented. But as a way of life, it's people are growing weary. Um, there is an anxiety um, that that's existing now, especially as you know, people are watching the rest of the world, you know, try to find ways to move on. And and there there is this sense that people want to see a light at the end of the tunnel, that they don't want to have to live with these sort of restrictions. The problem that China is having is vaccination, in that they're not reaching the critical mass that they need in vaccinating older Chinese citizens. Yeah. You know, there was this incredible moment when you were reporting on the pandemic where you were separated from your son and then you were reunited. And we, we saw that video on the Today Show and, and Nightly News, I think. And I, I'm wondering, those reunions are happening here now in the U.S. How strange is it? Uh, to kind of see people, to hug people, to kind of reconnect with people that you haven't seen physically in, in almost three years? It's, um, I mean, it's at, at the time that, that Jet and I were, were separated for that length of time, 49 days felt like a long time. Yeah. And, you know, there are so many people who have spent months and longer uh, away from people they love. And so to, to finally reconnect with with family has been, you know, it has been thrilling. On, on the one hand, it feels like such a long time, but yeah. then, you know, after a couple of days, it feels like no time has passed at all. And he still, he still fancies himself quite a celebrity. So, okay. Yeah, yeah, he, was on, he was on national television. He was on national moment. television, and he, he, he likes to remind me of it. Finally, I, I want to I end on an, on an uplifting note. What's, what's the one thing you've been so happy to do since you've been back? Drink tap water. <laughs> drink tap water? Are you serious? You can't drink tap. Small thrills. You, you, can't, you can't drink tap water over there at all. Uh, it's not advised. Oh. Um, so in general, it's, not connected to the pandemic. It's small things. Yeah. It's you know, it's it's becoming reconnected with you know with having a sense of freedom, uh, freedom of movement, not having to pull up my phone every two minutes to scan my code to get into a yeah. convenience store or to a shopping mall. Um, and it's also about, you know, seeing, you know, our son connect with family and to and to feel caught up and to, to have the time and the interaction and the warmth that he deserves. Janice Mackey Freer, we're so happy you're back in the U.S. and thank you for all of your reporting. Okay, coming up, Mexico's water crisis. New images showing just how dramatic water levels have dropped in the last seven years, how residents are coping, and what's being done to fix it. Stay with us. All right, we are back now with the Americas and to the water crisis in Mexico. A state of emergency declared across the country because of a worsening drought, and now residents are forced to save up on water as officials clamp down on usage. Aaron McLaughlin has the details. Tonight, desperation spilling into the streets of Nuevo Leon, Mexico, as families rush to stock up on water. Some using buckets, others the pots from their kitchen. Anything and everything to collect the last drop. Ya dejé mi trabajo por venir a juntar agua. The northern state of Mexico is in one of the worst droughts in over a decade after two years of dismal rainfall. Nearly the entire region straddling the U.S.-Mexico border is experiencing drought, according to the North American drought monitor. There's a good chance we're going to get another La Nina happening this winter. And so if this does happen, then I, I would expect the, the drought to very likely continue at least 
through the next uh, spring. NASA released these images of the Cerro Prieto Reservoir, showing just how dramatic water levels have dropped between 2015 and 2022, one of three reservoirs that provide more than half of Nuevo Leon's water supply. Droughts and intense droughts and, and drying trends are all very consistent with what we expect with the kind of climate change. The National Water Commission of Mexico has formally declared a state of emergency across the country, pushing officials to clamp down on water use. Al día de hoy, estamos viviendo un problema muy grave de falta de agua, de escasez de agua. Now residents are only allowed to use water for three hours a day, a desperate move in the midst of extreme heat. No llueve, no hay agua, no hay frutas. The heat and lack of water now targeting livelihoods. Pues no hay trabajo para, para la gente del campo. While others worry citizens aren't being prioritized. ¡Sando! Protesters gathering outside factories like Heineken and Coca-Cola. Se pongan en los zapatos de la gente que no tiene agua en las colonias que no tienen agua. Demanding they reduce water use and redirect it to citizens. El producto que ellos hacen no es de primera necesidad. People being more proactive and aware of, you know, what sustainable water use actually looks like in these regions is going to be, you know, increasingly important in a, uh, especially as we move to a warmer and very likely drier world. But for so many in Mexico, a warmer and drier world already a reality. Aaron joins us now from Los Angeles. And Aaron, I want to go back to that map in your piece. It's showing the severe drought across North America. We see that there are a few dark red regions in the U.S., in particular the western part of the country. What is preventing these regions from reaching water scarcity as we are currently seeing in northern Mexico? Well, Tom, experts say it's already happening here in the United States, although perhaps not as acute in major population centers as what we're seeing play out right now in Mexico. But the western portion of the United States has been in drought for the last 20 years. There are towns here in California, rural towns, that have completely run out of groundwater, and experts are warning that this problem could get worse with climate change. Tom? It is a serious problem. All right, Aaron, thank you for reporting that out for us. When we come back, you know that bond Bonkers Mega Millions drawing everyone's been talking about. You won't believe what one boss just did. What happens if he hits it big? We're talking $830 million and how much he just spent on those tickets. Stay with us. Finally tonight, one chicken finger chain raising the stakes on the Mega Millions jackpot, raising Kane's CEO buying $100,000 in lottery tickets and his hope, if he wins, to share with his employees. This is the sound of one company going all in on the Mega Millions jackpot, raising Kane's chicken CEO Todd Graves, buying one lottery ticket for each employee, hoping to get lucky. His co-CEO sharing their plan with employees on this video. That is 50,000 tickets, about 100 of stacks like this. It's, uh, this is uh, 500 tickets right here. So what do we do? Well, we wait anxiously. If we win, we win together. That co-CEO, A.J. Kumaran, says tonight's Mega Millions jackpot drawing, the third largest on record at $830 million, was the perfect way to engage with his employees. When we saw jackpot was one of the largest it's ever been last week, uh, we said, oh, this is a great opportunity to have some fun with the crew members and maybe give a little extra while having a lot of fun. <laughs> Just buying 50,000 lottery tickets took almost a whole day. We purchased the ticket yesterday. It took a little over eight hours to print all the tickets. If one of those tickets is a winner in the drawing tonight, the plan is to split the winnings evenly across the chain's 50,000 employees. That could mean thousands for every fry cook and cashier. You know, times are hard right now. Uh, when you're, whether you're in the grocery stores or pumping some gas, you're feeling the pressure of inflation, you know, all this bad news, et cetera, et cetera. But something like this puts a smile on everyone's face. Everyone believes they are the next uh, jackpot winner. Uh, and we have 50,000 people believing the same thing today. So we're having fun. This is one fast food company crossing their chicken fingers and hoping for a jackpot. If nothing else, we're going to have a lot of fun with a lot of lottery tickets. All right, I know what you're thinking. How much will each employee get? Well, if they win, remember, it's $830 million after taxes. If they take the lump sum, there's 50,000-plus employees. Each employee will get around, let's see here, $7,000.
Not exactly millionaires, but it's not a bad bonus. Uh, all right, we hope you played, we hope you win, and we thank you for watching Top Story. Stay right there, more news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.